All right. Good evening, everyone. My name is Kathy Chan, and I am the acting director of the University of Victoria's Center for Studies in Religion and Society for 2022-23. It's been another beautiful day in uh, at the University of Victoria, and I'd like to open this proceeding by acknowledging and respecting the Lekwungen peoples on whose traditional territory we are holding this lecture series and the Sanghi, Susquehamalt, and Wasanich peoples who have continuing historical relationships uh, with this land. And I'd like to welcome everyone, uh, whether you are here virtually or in person, uh, to I think our sixth public lecture of uh, the 2022 fall term. Uh, and I'm very pleased today to introduce the second graduate student um, in this year's lecture series, Lucy Kotasoska. Lucy is a doctoral candidate uh, in the uh, University of Victoria's English department, who is exploring, among other things, moments of vision and transcendence in modernist literature. We really enjoyed having Lucy at the center this fall, and I'm really looking forward to her talk on uh, the renegotiation of spirituality and creed in the work of a modern Irish poet. So welcome, Lucy. Thank you very much, Kathy. Uh, also, thank you to CSRS for having me tonight here. Thank you all of those who are present for coming tonight. Also, thanks to everyone who's online who is joining us via Zoom. Um, all right, without further ado, uh, let me start with this relatively brief lecture. Um, I hope I'm visible for everyone. I promise I won't be moving too much. Giving a lecture on November 17th is particularly significant and meaningful for me. 33 years ago on this day, which is celebrated as the International Students' Day, the demonstration of students in Prague marked the beginning of the end of the 40 years of a totalitarian regime in my home country, the Czech Republic. Seamus Heaney, the Nobel Prize winning Irish poet whose work I'm going to discuss and pay respect to in my talk this evening, deeply admired poets and dissident intellectuals from the Central and Eastern Europe. He said in one of his interviews, Quote, I recognize their predicament as an extreme stage of a discomfort I was experiencing myself, end quote. He would often quote words of his close friend, Joseph Brodsky, a Russian poet living in an American exile. <clears throat> can, you, can you all hear me very yeah, good? Because I have a sense that... Mm -hmm. um, uh, so back to Joseph Brodsky, sorry about that interruption. Quote, if art teaches anything, it's that the human condition is private, end quote. In my view, it is exactly this true that any totalitarian regime wants us to forget and tries in any way to make us unlearn. It is my deepest joy that I can talk to you here tonight as a voice mediating this teaching. Besides paying my respect to Heaney's lifelong lyric activity to this end, I want to dedicate this talk to all of those people who stepped out into a freezing, windy evening in Prague on November 17, 1989, to make, in Heine's words, hope and history rhyme. I'd like to open this presentation with a quote from Seamus Heaney's essay, The Redress of Poetry, where he puts forth an important definition of poetry, which I would like you to keep in mind during my talk. He writes, quote, poetry has to be a working model of inclusive consciousness. It should not simplify. Its projections and inventions should be a match for the complex reality which surrounds it and out of which it is generated, end quote. The inclusive consciousness bears a special importance in relation to his aesthetics, to the, sorry, to the aesthetics he develops in the sequence of squarings, which is the focus of my analysis. This sequence was published as a part of the collection titled Seeing Things in 1991 
As the poet stepped into the fourth decade of his poetic activity, it takes up practically the whole second half of the collection and consists of 48 poems divided into four sections. Lightenings, settings, crossings, and squarings. Translated into the language of prose, this would be, let's say, a long short story or a novella. Each section contains 12 new zans, or simply 12 liners. The resulting pattern is a more or less perfect squaring of 12 lines by 12 poem, poems in each section, four sections squaring up the total. But I would add a warning here. Let's not make mathematical fascination outshine the metaphysics and aesthetics of Yeni's exploration. Or we might actually say discovery, as the two zanes in squarings have every quality of what he calls la verre donnée, or given, right? Given verses or found verses. Um, Yeni recalls the first stirrings of the form in an interview in 2008. Quote, I was sitting in this most beautiful reading room in the National Library of Ireland with the rain coming down on the glass dome. Suddenly, I wrote a few lines and it became a 12 line, four, three lines thing. It felt given, strange and unexpected. I didn't quite know where it came from, but I knew immediately it was there to stay. I may exaggerate, but I do not misrepresent if I say that in general, I was subject I was subject to the poems and not the other way around, end quote. In one of the poems, which I give in its entirety here, um, sorry, the poet reimagines a scene related in Annals where the monks of Clonmac Noise, which is, or rather was a monastery in Ireland founded in 544 by Saint Kieran, Witness a most wondrous occurrence. A ship descends to them at prayers in church through the roof, radically transforming their perspective and orientation in terms of transcendence as it might manifest itself in human life. And I'd like to read this whole poem for you. The annals say, when the monks of Clonmac Noise were all at players, sorry, prayers inside the oratory, a ship appeared above them in the air. The anchor dragged along be behind so deep, it hooked itself into the altar rail. And then as the big hull dropped to a standstill, a crewman shinned and grappled down the rope and struggled to release it, but in vain. This man can't bear our life here and will drown, the abbot said, unless we help him. So they did. The freed ship sailed and the man climbed back out of the marvelous as he had known it. It seems that it casts its spell on you. <laughs> In my reading of Hine's sequence, this episode becomes one of these structural keys to understand what is at stake aesthetically and spiritually at this later point in his career. I believe that it unlocks the way to our understanding of Hine's non credal yet intuitively traditional spirituality, which cannot be fully appreciated without realizing that the poem should be actually read as a reflection of the threefold morphology of the self. In this structural interpretation of the individual human existence, the physical body is temporarily united and infused with spirit. The dynamic and unique juncture which is thus created is represented by the individual consciousness. I believe that it is this consciousness re-emerging in the awareness of its potential and intuitively in touch with its immanent spirituality, which finds its expression and aesthetic terrain in squaring. Further, as we will see, it is this reanimated and synthesizing model of human consciousness, which liberates the poet's expression and signals the opening up of a new creative space, which he could finally enter. And he could enter this space without guilt and anxiety often detected in his previous work where he notoriously struggled with demands of political partisanship in the middle of the troubles in Northern Ireland. One of the reasons I felt compelled to analyze this sequence and considered revisiting of its specific terrain, almost an imperative for myself, was not exactly a lack of critical attention it had attracted, but rather a set of interpretive fallacies 
that had emerged and were being re-articulated in the wake of its publication. The sequence of squarings introduces a shimmering play of, quote, shifting brilliancies, unquote. These two words are the very first two words of the whole sequence, shifting brilliancies as the light of various sources and angles constantly traverses its lines. This prominent shift from his initial focus on elements physical, earthy, suggestively palpable, and almost oppressively close to touch, as presented in his first few collections from the late 1960s and early 1970s, could not leave the grounds of critical response unsettled. If we engage more closely with the critical work published on squaring, we see Hines interpreters wrestling with the impact and location of what would be best summed up as the transcendental in the universe of the poet's new collection. The first common misinterpretation of Hines' move toward this more, let's say, aerial matter has motivated the reproach that the poet abandoned the physical reality of his earlier pieces. As Stephen Rizzo observes, quote, Several of his critics have picked up on his new found freedom, but have misattributed it to a mere turning away from the material reality, end quote. Critical voices articulating this view have not, been, have not been able to productively reconcile the simultaneous presence of the new sources, sources of inspiration in Hines poetry with those long established ones. Other voices, while not exactly unsettled over the disappearing physical emphasis in Hines' lines, have still struggled with the possible mode of existence of these transcendental elements in relation to the worldly. In one of the reviews of Seeing Things, a concern was articulated that, quote, the ordinary conceptual structure of the world is deranged, end quote. While another review saw his new poetry as, quote, not quite it, but above the world of his earlier poetry, not detached from that world, but floating on top of it, end quote. A certain metaphysical naivety seems to mark these statements, unable or unwilling to acknowledge the perfect fusion of both kinds of elements in terms of their poetic cohabitation in the later Hine. Beside the conflicted, sorry, conflicted arguments regarding the weakening grip of Hine's poetry upon the physical world, there has emerged another major critical current misinterpreting Hines' achievement in spiritual terms. These voices have claimed that he abandoned religious tradition and that he was no longer a believer when drafting Seeing Things. While it is certainly true that, as Kieran Quinlan points out, Hines' beliefs were something different from what we call ex explicit creed of faith, and that during the 1990s, he was drafting his poems in the shade of the process of secularization accelerating throughout Irish society, Heaney never completely abandoned his early religious formation. In his Nobel Prize acceptance speech in 1995, he said that in poetry, we can at last grow up to that which we stored up as we grew, which, to me is a quite a fantastic quote. And it's a, such a great um, um, summary of basically saying that, let's say no transformation might happen without um, having its roots in the previous development or experience. Um, okay, let's continue here. Nahu Vashizuka, one of the critics who polemized with Hini's later development, considers poems collected in seeing things as post-Christian and claims that the poet's stance is rather skeptical and ironic when confronting the final things and the ultimate crossing. I believe that doubt should be actually viewed as a necessary and fertilizing element of one's faith. And Hini's stance negotiated in squaring should be rather valued as, let's say, neo-Christian in its creative combination of inherited elements and an intensive personal search. While for Washizuka, the penultimate line of the first Luzane of the sequence, quote, there is no next time round, end quote, signals and confirms the loss of the author's fate in the spiritual dimension, which would sustain the myth of the afterlife. I would like to offer a reading challenging this interpretation. 
if we understand the underlying assumption regarding the individual's threefold morphology, which he inherited and re-inhibited, it becomes clear that the statement of no next time round does not preclude, sorry, preclude an intuitively spiritual existence pointing most emphatically to the unique juncture of consciousness, which I see as the true critical pivot of the sequence. Unlike the critical voices, which were given hearing in the lines above, I believe that composing squarings, Heaney did not commit any act of detectable refusal, but much rather creatively reclaimed what had been his already. At the time of composing the sequence, the memory of Heaney's early immersion in Catholic theology and practice during his years at the prestigious St. Columbus College in Derry might have faded, yet, as R. Foster reminds us, quote, a Catholicism of the imagination would remain, end quote. In many respects, Heaney's spiritual development resembled the inner journey of another world-known Irish author, James Joyce. I'm sure that name rings familiar to you. While they both ultimately rejected any conventional pieties and aesthetic subordination to the socio-political dictate of these, they both remained respectful of and inspired by the coherence of the Catholic system and its world outlook. Reflecting upon this parallel, Heine said, quote, I suppose, like many Catholics, lapsed or not, I am of the Stephen Dedalus frame of mind. Stephen Dedalus, that's one of the main heroes, right, um, of James Joyce's um, so if you desert, desert the system, you're deserting the best there is, and there is no point in exchanging one great coherence for some other ad hoc arrangement, end quote. Elaborating further on the decisive importance of his early religious upbringing, he reflected, quote, I stopped practicing a long time ago, but some of it holds. If you have it as a child, it gives you a structure of consciousness, the idea there's something more. End quote. I believe that articulating the key impact which Catholicism had on the structuring of his consciousness, he offers us the most definite guiding insight into the sequence of squarings. If we are to credit the traditionally Catholic threefold morphology of the self, we quickly begin to understand why so many critical attempts at locating the spiritual in the sequence have failed. This morphology also clearly explains why there cannot be any next time round and why this claim does not run contrary to the speaker's spirituality. While the realm of the physical body and the realm of the spiritual element might extend beyond its circumference and comprehension, it is nevertheless this consciousness which effectively mediates between the two poles or orders and serving as a point of contact between their particular impulses communicates the sense of wholeness of human existence. As I have shown and analyzed, there has been a lively critical polemics engaging with Heaney's spirituality in this sequence and its intrinsic presence within the inner lining of the self, to use Heaney's own words, has been ignored so far as a factor which radically transformed our understanding of the poem. As we may see, adjusting to this religious squaring of the sequence, Heaney is not primarily concerned with pursuing the transcendental, the immortal, or the intangible here. Instead, finding comfort and a bolstering impulse in the constitutive spirituality of human consciousness, he sets out to explore in aesthetic terms the territory which this comprehensive consciousness registers and the various configurations of phenomena, both physical and spiritual, it draws upon when coming into its own. Heaney introduces an illuminating self-referential paradox when he writes in his essay titled Crediting Poetry, um, quote, for years, I was bowed to the desk like some monk bowed over his prayer. Some dutiful contemplative pivoting his understanding in an attempt to bear his portion of the weight of the world, knowing himself incapable 
of heroic virtue or redemptive effect, but constrained by his obedience to his rule to repeat the effort and the posture. Blowing up sparks for a meager heat, forgetting faith, straining toward good works, end quote. Finally, straightening up and abandoning his position of duty and striving in practice, he wakes up to the new intensity of his inherent constitutive spirituality, being finally able in his own words to attend to the diamond absolute. <clears throat> the fascinating process of Hine's growing awareness of the comprehensive circumference of his consciousness might be detected in poems preceding squaring in their completion. Placed immediately before this sequence in the collection, Seeing Things is fostering. And once more, you have the whole text here in front of you. Um, Fostering is a poem which was inspired by John Montague's lines, heavily indebted to the physical memories of a childhood in rural Ireland and haunted by the specter of the horizon rigged with industrial machinery instilling the hereditary and in its relentless rhythm, inescapable in placeness in the poet's imagination. Just very quickly for your information, the name might not be so familiar to you, John Montague was also a poet of Catholic background, growing up in a little village in Northern Ireland, uh, just very similar to Heaney, very similar to him. And uh, he was a slightly older contemporary of Seamus Heaney. And as you can see, um, quite a lasting presence and inspiration for him too. Okay, I'll read the poem for you. Let me just grab my water quickly. We have a great word here. I can start with that, maybe to just lighten up things. Uh, what is that? Can, can you guess? Could you take a guess? Your daily gong. What's that? Does that sound like something in more standard English? Okay. I found out only recently because it's quite difficult to um, really dig into these, let's say, Hiberno English words. It's very difficult to really get to know the meaning. This is daily gone, means daylight is gone, simply dusk. So here we are now at daily gone, <laughs> studying some of Hini's best poetry. Okay, so here we go. Um, the line from Montague is here at the top that heavy greenness fostered by water. And this is Hini. At school, I loved one picture's heavy greenness, horizons rigged with windmills, arms, and sails. The mill houses still outlines, their in placeness still more in place when mirrored in canals. I can't remember never, never having known the imminent hydraulics of the land, of glare and glitz and floods at daily gone. My silting hope, my lowlands of the mind, heaviness of being and poetry sluggish in the doldrums of what happens. Me waiting until I was nearly 50 to credit marvels, like the tree clock of tin cans the tinkers make. So long for air to brighten, time to be dazzled, and the heart to lighten. Jumps up and forward at the end, doesn't it? Um, sorry for this a little slightly confusing color scheme here. These are not hyperlinks. Um, I have a couple of poems here for you, or parts of the poems from squarings or seeing things. Um, and these are the specific words or turns of phrases and um, phrases I just want to somehow accentuate and I read in my text because we don't have time to go through all of the texts or all of the dozens I would like to read here. Um, that's your task. After you, after we finish, you can just go online, see seeing things. I think it's accessible, actually, the text in its entirety, it's accessible through our library. So take that chance. I don't know how many people can download it once, but you can have a try. 
Um, okay, so the geologic, sorry, the geologically conditioned ins inscription here in this poem is reflected in quote, lowlands of the mind and results in another quote, heaviness of being experienced by the speaker for many years of his young adulthood. When he finally finds himself breaking with this oppressive artistic habitus and turning his attention to the marvelous, he might not yet be consciously and confidently introspective. The perfect rhyme joining the final couplet still shows a slight touch of the previously mentioned striving. Yet the title of the poem shows a curious split of consciousness announcing the coming strategies and returns of squarings. While fostering might be, might be referring to the described act of abandoning the imagery and inspiration weighing down on the speaker's mind and leaving the local artistic genealogy, it might also refer to the fact of coming back to one's own original sensitivity before the sense of its various tones and spheres was lost during the period of being fostered in the self-alienating care presented by fame, public, and its expectations. I feel that the story of the tree clock of tin cans, which is mentioned here, and I, sorry, for some reason, haven't highlighted that, should be related here as it adds quite a bit of poignancy to Heine's squarings of elements spiritual and aesthetic, and it carries with it the whiff of elation communicated so powerfully by the poem, which sets, up, sets us up for squarings. In one of his interviews, Heaney recalled, quote, I'd heard a story years before in Wicklow about people in a certain district who had made a pact with the devil. I can't remember what boon they were granted, but in, but in exchange, they agreed that the devil would come at a certain time on a certain day to collect their souls. And of course, as the hour neared, the panic heightened until at the last minute, this band of tinsmiths, tinkers, landed and proposed to build a fantastic tin clock in a tree and set the time wrong. Then once that's done, the devil arrives and discovers he has made a mistake, has arrived too late and broken the agreement. So the people are released. Listening to the poet's words, one starts to develop a good sense of how different, delicate and decisive was the working of this other machinery in the poem compared to the operations mentioned at the beginning of fostering, and how sensitive the poet's inner clock might have been around this time as he was turning 50. In squarings, Heaney seems to be too consumed exploring this Prussian territory of consciousness to dwell on his poetic proceedings too much, but I believe that we may still detect several passages in the sequence where the modus operandi gets revealed. I have already mentioned the wonderful image of monks in the nave of the Clon McNoise Church. And sorry, I'll just make a stop here. I'm just endlessly fascinated by the little details in his poetry and it concerned even etymology because when you think about nave and there's a ship coming entering this nave, we have just the same route. You right? have two ships encountering each other. Um, the two experiential poles, the two orders of things revealingly meet and are fastened to each other as the ship's anchor, quote, hooks itself into the altar rails, end quote. It is a consciousness alert to multiple stimuli of various orders, which in fact realizes this encounter. Similar to the annals, the consciousness becomes a unifying and reifying authority. The process of consciousness coming to its force and creatively expanding is also explored in Lightning Six, where Thomas Hardy, English novelist and poet as well, is introduced as a child, quote, out in a field of sheep, end quote. What a nice image, right, of this very, very famous figure just laying down a field of sheep as a child. He's seen laying down and experimenting with infinity as he exposes, quote, his small, small, sorry, small, cool brow like an anvil, end quote, to be worked upon by the sky and made singing, quote, the perfect pitch, end quote. The ripple and stir of this occasion will, quote, travel 80 years outward from there, end quote, 
as the mind will carry on this impulse of joining impact, quote, to be the same ripple inside him at its last circumference, end quote, while the identity and coherence of the consciousness hold. <clears throat> A similar inclusiveness expressed as longing can be detected, sorry, detected in settings 23. And just, uh, I already let you know that there are four sections to this long poem. Uh, they all bear their own individual title, but the numbering of those 48 dozens just like goes throughout the whole thing. <clears throat> so if you were just wondering about the math here. So here the speaker wants, quote, a poem of utter evening, end quote. A free song is remembered, but not any words as the consciousness has not been fully engaged and activated which would have helped the transcription. Instead, a scene lit up by the Icelandic midnight sun is presented within a triplet as a perfect reflection of the mentioned three unity. Quote, Snorri Sturlason, who has come out to bathe in a hot spring and sit through the stillness after milking time, lathe and ensconced in the throne room of his mind, end quote. The cited passage, Sorry, the cited passages represent just several pieces of more explicit textual evidence documenting the structuring background of Venus poetics as developed in the sequence. Just for your information, Story, Snorri, I can never say that name, Snorri Sturluson was born in the late 12th century in Iceland and was known as a poet, historian, and politician. Just to give you the idea of how broad Venus references are in the sequence. He travels wildly in his imagination and his research. Snorri was very fond of taking hot baths and you can still see a bathtub at his original estate in Iceland, if you happen to be there ever. It is connected to one of the numerous local thermal springs through a stone pipeline and uses earthborne heat. And I was just thinking, who says that Heaney was losing touch with the physical in the sequence? Okay. In squarings, Heaney does not by any means forward what we could term an explicitly religious poetry, yet the sequence can be viewed as an act of religious understanding. Etymologically considered, the word religion has its roots in Latin verb religare, which means to bind or more accurately, accurately to rebind. It is this original meaning of the word which gets activated in all the sections of the poem and which becomes the main aesthetic force behind its lines. We have already explored the structural proposition of the sequence. Let's now turn our attention to the mastery of its content, binding together challenging oppositions of aspects material and spiritual. Combining elements tangible and solid with lightweight airy ones, Heaney reaches a fascinating level of their experiential confrontation and a certain kind of shifting intimacy. This intensity and interaction are introduced in the very first lines of the sequence as the winter light falls, quote, in a doorway and on the stone doorstep, end quote, entering, as it were, the solidities of the poem's terrain. In the quarry scene, in Squaring's 10, we watch, quote, the cargo brightness traveling, end quote, as the clouded sky and puddled water tease out their unfathomable elements reflecting each other. A series of queries comes echoing up, quote, could you reconcile what was diaphanous there with what was massive? Were you equal to or were you opposite? to build up so promiscuous and weightless. The poetic consciousness shares unconflicted the fundaments of both. In a similarly intuitive orchestration of elements in crossings 32, the stepping stones of a cosy or cosy, sorry, I'll be probably mispronouncing the Irish word. Somebody might help me. <laughs> no, uh, well, just I'm trying my best. Okay. Cozy becomes stations of the soul, and the clothes left by the turf cutters on one side of the burn 
might have been cast off by the crossing souls. This scene, rife with liminalities and precarious balances at the water's edge, is actually cherished by the speaker who, who says, quote, it steadies me to tell these things, end quote. Beyond the constantly conversing ontologies of the two orders, it is also the aspect of their differing chronology or their way of existing in or out of time, which is being continually reflected and processed within the circumference of the registering consciousness in the poem. While the physical order of the material force is necessarily involved in time being constantly worked upon by it and marked by its passing, the spiritual order bent towards the meditative defies the time's processes, transcending their dictate in its ultimate atemporality. The consciousness rippling through squarings communicates both impulses. The sequence as a whole seems to be a lively meditative sorry, mediation between these two chronologic qualities. While dozens of narrative character appear in all four sections of the sequence, mostly bound to the speaker's memories, this temporal linearity and binding principle never reach out toward other poems or other dozens. The narrative element is present, yet notably fragmented and deflected as it ricochets against the moments of solid meditation and virtually unmoving stillness of intervening dozens. For instance, the opening poem, where a beggar's silhouette is only slightly shivering, is a perfect example of a visionary piece locked in time or out of time, and it sets an atemporal modality which becomes strongly resonant throughout the first half of the section, including Lightning Street and Five, which are fully inflected by this still quality while describing the squarings during the game of marbles. Only the closing section of the poem Five comes alive in agency. Quote, improvise, make free, end quote, to introduce the narrative, and working of memory in the following piece on Hardy, which we, um, which we analyzed. The section as a whole ends on a meditative note once again as time is pierced in its extremity in the scene of the cross in Lightning's 12. That's the end of the first section. And when the spirit, quote, flares in an phenomenal instant with pure exhilaration before death, end quote. The narrative parts of the sequence are usually only very vaguely positioned in time, just to give you an idea. One afternoon, heat wavered, or on winter evenings, which compromises their in-time authority. Further, these narrative pieces do not fully own their meaning within the time of their occurrence, and only the mediating consciousness might catch glimpses of it in the meditative rifts in time. Thus, for instance, the speaker in his infancy is, quote, cradled in an elbow like a secret, open now as the eye of heaven was then. What a great way to describe being um, nursed, right? Wonderful. Or later, when in college, he feels, quote, the absolute river between us and it all, end quote, trying to, quote, Flip the light on what we could not have, end quote, at that specific moment. These are college students looking out of the window and seeing two people dating going on in their head. So this is the chronologically based dialectics which binds the alternate, alternating experiential orders within the sequence. This alternation is in fact remarkably tight as it frequently operates within the space of an individual poem. The memory of sliding on ice in crossings 28 works itself into the constant re-entering of the repeated process, quote, the race up the free passage and return, end quote, until the bodily mechanics, quote, followed on itself like a ring of light. You have little kids or a memory of being a child sliding on the ice, right, until the pattern is just perfected. It's almost like a timeless moment. In Crossing 30, the ritual of St. Bridget's Day connects the physical memory of jumping through the girdle of straw rope with the atemporal promise of the new life. In the following poem, the process of driving a car 
is seen accelerating to the, to the point that a, quote, sand made, end quote, becomes sensitive to the millionth of a flicker, end quote, thus virtually any, sorry, annihilating time fragmented to the infinitesimal. Nominalizations proliferate throughout the whole sequence. We have words like the shake the heart or the longed for. As the transcribing consciousness mediates between experience marked by ascent to time and that being in hiatus with it. In a series of close textual confrontations, we have explored the physical order of the body moving in time and the spiritual order of the soul moving between a temporal coordinate. The synthesizing and transcribing force of the consciousness born upon their juncture is evidently of its own order, material as well as abstract, linear as well as synchronously associative. In squarings, Heaney proves beyond doubt that it is the order of language, and more specifically, the language and domain of poetry, which present the perfect medium for the synthesizing challenge which the spiritually inflected consciousness poses and demands. In this sequence, he does not waver in his language. That's one of the words he uses in the poem, waver, wavering, do not waver in language. He calls on the like-minded spirits of Yeats, Hardy, or Pasternak for possible inspiration and support. Yet his own voice comes across clear, non-derivative, unfussy, and believable. As one of the critics, Daniela Panzera correctly observes, quote, such linguistic freedom could possibly reflect Heine's spiritual freedom, end quote. In squarings, the rediscovered model of human consciousness liberates Heine's expression and the poetic reflection of its synthetic territory signals a new creative space, which he could finally enter without the guilt and doubt, characteristic of his previous works. In the words of Michael Kavanaugh, another pretty famous critic, um, no poet critic of the late 20th century has worried as much as he about the legitimacy of poetry and about the space where, quote, it may be at home without being confined by literal place or by political or parochial ideology, end quote. The spiritual morphology informing the sequence of squarings opened and secured such space for him, fully legitimizing his creative effort. Returning now to the opening quote from The Redress of Poetry, where Heaney insists on the working model of poetry as first of all, if you remember, an inclusive consciousness, and in extension, quote, another truth to which we can have recourse and before which we can know ourselves in a more fully empowered way, end quote, we can conclude that in squarings, he indeed realized the spiritual and aesthetic deliverance. That's all. Thank you very much for listening. And please let me know if you have any questions or comments or wondering about them. Thanks so much, Lucy. There was uh, so much that was great. And uh, ooh. Great about that. I'm not sure what's going on with my microphone, so I'll just perhaps uh, see if there are any questions. We have a few. Yeah. Oh, well, we will we will distribute the mic so that people can hear online. Thanks so much for the talk. It was great. I'm just curious to know to what extent the squarings pattern that Heaney develops shows him either rediscovering or rethinking his, I think, remarkably astute interpretation of George Herbert's The Temple in Redress of Poetry. Because in The Redress of Poetry, he says that the DNA, and I'm basically mm -hmm. quoting, the DNA movement of Herbert's verse is up-down crisscross motion, which is such a simple and subtle way of encapsulating clearly the, the greatest religious lyricist um, in English. And I think someone who Heaney is drawing on. And then Heaney turns to Herbert's The Pulley to exemplify that movement. And he takes Herbert as the sign of the sort of fullest realization of sanity 
mm -hmm. um, possible. So of all the of all the people you mentioned, you didn't mention Herbert, and it seemed to me like that that pattern is there. So I'm just wondering if you'd thought about the squaring sequence and his reading of Herbert and where Herbert fits within this interpretation of Heaney. I'm not sure. Thank you very much for the question. I can't remember, to be honest, mentioning Herbert. No, no. And I, um, but I, um, I can see like your, um, your direction. Maybe I could, uh, I know that Heaney was very strongly, strongly inspired by uh, Gerald Manley Hopkins, maybe to just like, how to, how to better interconnect our genealogy a bit here. Um, and um, he said, well, oh, but, but of course, he was always a bit, how to put that, a bit reluctant to converse too much with, I would say with uh, English poets, or he did so quite um, with certain like, certain scruple, right? But he was definitely, he was, he was definitely interested. He even ended up uh, writing, on a great piece on Larkin, on Jeffrey Hill, Ted Hughes, and so on. Um, um, mentioning, going uh, just, if you don't mind, just going back to Hopkins, because that fascinated me in uh, studying his progression and his theoretical um, background and just underpinnings, how um, there's this line in, and I don't know the title of the poem, but that uh, Jesus plays, or sorry, no, Christ plays in thousands of places. That's Hopkins, right? And so I can see that in Heaney. Not only he went back to this direct, precise quote, but I can see that in this patterning of squaring. You can see what I mean. Um, I'm quite aware that I uh, try to like weave together many or multiple strands in this pretty um, concise lecture for today. I hope to expand this a little bit further in my dissertation. This like should be, let's say, the first section of that. So this is all still awaiting my more, like, let's say, detailed. Mm -hmm. mm. 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 There's an incredible generosity. So he takes Herbert as the model of English civility. And he says, he says yes, like mm -hmm. Herbert embodies the things England has claimed to be imperializing, colonizing others mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. over. And nevertheless says, but, and it's the biggest conjunctive turn, but there's something real to this in terms of Herbert's sanity. And so there's an incredible generosity he shows to England and England's poetry um, at the end of Redress of Poetry there. Mm -hmm. um, and I, th I think Herbert is a much um, closer um, figure for understanding Heaney than Joyce is for reasons I'd ha be happily explain for, to, there. But so anyway, I would just ask you to think about yeah. Herbert there. No, thank you very much. And um, I wonder like if you could actually extend and I, I would be I would be very careful and very picky about that if you could like extend maybe the some of the like metaphysical traditional some of its elements maybe into see how that works in Heaney. But I would as I said I would be, I would be very 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 but thank you very much for bringing this name in. Thank you. We might I uh, have a couple more questions. So while, we're, while people are thinking of them, um, I, I wanted to bring you back to a, a quote that you uh, uh, read right at the beginning, not, not from the poet itself, but I, and I think it was, you were saying Heaney said that it's that if art teaches us, teaches us anything, it is that the human condition is, and, and if I would have stopped there and just guessed what was going to be next, you know, I'd think mm -hmm. beautiful, complex, something else. So when you said private, that's such an intriguing and curious word to choose if you're going to choose one word about the human condition as a poet. And, and, I, and, I, and I could kind of see it in the poetry, but I'm new to this and to Heaney. And then I thought I saw it again, like was thinking about it again when you said at the end that he was really concerned with the legitimacy of poetry. And I think I've heard you say that before, that 
Um, it was really important to him that it not be influenced by politics or ideology. Can you explain a little bit more about that? Is that related to his idea about the privacy of the human condition? Thank you, Kathy. That's a, that's a great question. And it's one of the, I would say, key concerns for me in my future work. And this is pointing towards it because uh, what I plan to explore in my dissertation, hopefully just to reveal some of my plans, we'll see how that goes, is the actually the renegotiation between, and that's, I think I used the title in the first letter, right, also for the center, renegotiation, renegotiation in modern Irish poetry between worlds private and public, right, between these two territories, and how this is done in works uh, of four poets, with each of them having their, let's say, particular theme, maybe almost like a life theme, right? For Heaney, it was his dialogue with the Catholic tradition, which was a point of entry for him into the spiritual. For Derek Mahon, it was quite a different tradition, Protestant tradition. For even Boland, it was her motherhood, which actually opened this dialectic in a new way for her. So going back to your question, that's my main concern. And it's also my main concern, not only in terms of my dissertation, but also in my whole, I would say, activity as a literary scholar, because what's important for me and why I entered this business <laughs> um, is to somehow, like Nina says, redress of poetry, right? He needs to strike a certain like new balance of things. I would say I try to like redress, um, let's say, literature's maybe function and role in our lives because I noticed that um, a little bit of, a little bit maybe for me, a little bit too much of literary research has been done under, in the direction, under conditions and with the orientation towards, let's say, cultural, political, social and so on, which is perfectly legitimate, but it's not, it should not be the whole story, right? Or the whole, so, and I was fascinated by the quote uh, from Joseph Brodsky because, and as I mentioned that at the beginning, this, to me, it summed up what also a totalitarian regime or like any authoritarian, authoritarian regime might do too. Thank you. I think I saw a hand at the back. Is that Thank you so much, uh, Lucy. Um, yeah, I really, really loved uh, this this vision that, that you were giving us of, of Heaney. And um, one one element that was really sticking out for me as you were uh, pulling from these these pieces were, were the metaphors of water. Um, I just you know you just kept on returning to to, to water kind of being at, at play here. Um, but then at the end, uh, you uh, you directed us to the, this notion of Poetry kind of functioning as um, I know I know it's over there, but um, poetry functioning in, in in more of like a solid sense uh, that mm -hmm. that it it, uh, it it works to to you know maybe unite the the trans the transcendent and the uh, the imminent through this this uh, this way of, of maybe clarity, um, and I'm wondering if if that operates kind of in opposition to, to the water. And if that operates in opposition to this sense of, of, of flux, of flow that we see, it seems like is, is really operating in, in Heaney. I, I wonder if, um, if, if, if that's a problem or, or if, if rather there's, the, the poetry is actually crystallizing just that wavering and, and, and that's the, the strength to it or maybe something else altogether. But. Thank you so much. Um, again, great question and since you are such an attentive listener. Um, what are you, right? Like, okay, well, um, yeah, he could never stay away <laughs> from water, it seems, right? Um, there's a wonderful poem. It's at the end of his um, next collection, the collection which followed, I think, um, Seeing Things, which was called The Spirit Level. And at the end, there's a poem called Postscript. And you might be interested in having a look at that because there's him driving just along the shore, right? So being, and just finding himself, sorry, finding himself between two worlds almost, between like two motions being in his mind, driving, looking out. 
And uh, uh, it seems to me that, and it, it's great, there is, a, there is a paradox and there's, a, there's tension, there's connection in Heine. He himself said that poetry is always stretched between politics and between the land and between transcendence, right? So there's always this, and water might be like accentuating it for you. That's such a, you know, such a great connection. So you're right that there's some solidity and there's always an airiness maybe, which in the quarry scene, we have some puddles of water with the um, clouds being reflected. Also these stepping stones, stepping stones, that, that was such a mind, thought like mind um, image or a metaphor for him, stepping stones. He was fascinated by being at the water's edge, by, as I said, by the liminality of that space too. Right? And he saw his progression as a poet and his life in terms of stepping stones. He says, you never arrive at the end, it's just another stepping stone. Him skipping above water. All right, then let's just finish up by, I'm gonna ask you one more question just to, um, so there was so much I, I, I liked in that talk I, and it was the little surprising moments. And I guess that's what is wonderful about poetry in a way, right? The other thing I loved was that he said he didn't, what did you say he didn't wanna, well, he rejected pi, pieties. He was inspired by the coherence mm -hmm. of the Catholic mm -hmm. system. Um, which I also found really intriguing. It's not the word I would have initially thought, right? It's not why mm -hmm. most people, and, and didn't want to reject it for something ad hoc. Do you see that as, is that kind of related to the way in which he's structuring his poetry, his coherence, uh, an important um, thing for him in his, in his work? I think, I think so, I think it is. Uh, and uh, in this, I feel that in this talk I place his consciousness at the center, mm -hmm. maybe his like own, um, his own take on this structure, on this cosmos almost like being orchestrated in a certain way. And so it is, and he had also like a beloved image of the human mind, which works um, in terms of ripples, right? As you go through life, experiencing things, it's just like these ripples, concentric ripples, get wider and wider. And wider. Mm. Right, as you're reflecting the growth of your mind. Yeah, that was a beautiful part of that, that so poem. There was the part on Hardy, right? Yeah. The rippling. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Beautiful. Well, thank you very much, Lucy. That was. Uh... Oh, you have one online question. Okay, we've just got time. I'll give you the mic. This is from fellow grad student, Jessica. She says, dear Lucy, thank you so much for that wonderful analysis. Can you say more about talking about your, your need to identify the quote, mediating, registering, synthesizing consciousness of the poem? Would you say that it is like a narrator or is it evoked by the poem? Or is it somewhere between the poem and the poet? <laughs> in one minute or less. I'll probably have, hopefully, more time to <laughs> discuss that with um, Jessica. But um, I think that he needs said, again, it, 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 that's such a very, like, a great, very, I feel like a heavy question, but also like light and playful, right? There are both qualities in him. He said, he said he was visited by poetry, which is something quite, uh, how to put it, responsible, right? That's heavy, but he turns it into this way of his seeing world and using his favorite images, putting so much love of people he met, places he saw, a country he inhabits. Sorry, Jessica, I don't know if that answers your question. I don't think so. I just got to the point of starting answering that question, but hopefully tomorrow we might get a chance to get into this dialogue a bit more. So that's all for me. Right. 
Well, please join me in uh, thanking uh, Lucy for a wonderful presentation. Thanks very much. And uh, just uh, before you go, we um, have uh, two more two, two more lectures, right, this term. And uh, next week we have uh, Professor uh, Zhang Ping Chen from the uh, Department of History at the University of Victoria, who's going to be talking about religion, racism, and rivalry in North American Chinatown. So please join us for that. And uh, once again, thanks to Lucy uh, for a great uh, lecture tonight. Thanks very much. Thank you.